Hang on, Janet. Start again. Okay. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, now. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first Society for One Place Studies Hangout on Air for 2018. In fact, it's the first for some time, so it's uh, nice to be having them again. And this evening, we're going to discuss some aspects of house history. Oh. Janet. Ah, uh, yes. Somebody's, somebody's not using headphones. It might be me. I don't have it. The iPad doesn't take headphones. Um, Sorry. Go ahead and mute this. Yeah, can you mute it? Oh. I'm going to I'm going to mute you. Please. Yes. Yeah, I have done. Okay, try again, Janet. <laughs> Start from the top again. <laughs> Oh, I think we all got your introduction. Yeah, we got your Janet. introduction. Carry we on, got my man. introduction. I just don't know how much yeah. of this is being recorded and put on the YouTube. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to look for the next hour or so at some aspects of researching house history, and I'm going to concentrate on the house as a building, as much as the people who are in it, um, and to look at some of the perhaps well, not it's unusual it's resources. Happening again. What's happening? What's happening? Um... I'm not hearing any interference. So. No, I'm, it's a kind of shush, shush, shush noise in the background. But I'm happy to play one through it if other people Sorry are. I'm just going to try muting people and seeing. Sorry, <laughs> Hope it's not me. <laughs> Do you want me to carry on talking? Yeah, I've got the headset. Do you want me to carry on talking, Peter? Yes? Yes. Nod. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll start to try and get up the PowerPoint and... Uh, have a look at some of the sources that we have been considering. All right. Hopefully, hopefully that should now be evident. Yes. Can people see that? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. So this is Spring Hill, which is in East Lancashire between Bury and Burnley, about 20 miles north of Manchester. And it's about 12 houses, <coughs> but it's based on the estate that was owned by the owner of Sprinkle House, which is the one that is number seven on there. Uh, the original Sorry, Sprinkle... Can it? Yeah? I, 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 it's still happening, I'm afraid, to me anyway. And right. you're, you're the only one I haven't muted, so I don't know. Pass, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know what's... I've checked my headphones and it's, it is using the microphone. Mm. I, I'm getting feedback as well. Sorry about this. Yeah. What would you like me to do? Well, try try going again. Okay. No, that's repeating. Oh dear, sorry about this. I'm not even saying anything. <laughs> no. I am though. Yeah. No? Shall I carry on? Shall I continue? Okay. So Sprinkle House is number seven, and that was the house as originally built. And the ones that are numbered eight and nine on that diagram were added as an extension at a later date, and we'll come on to that. And the others, the majority of the others, are based on various outbuildings and cottages for the estate and the estate workers. <clears throat> it isn't the oldest house in the area, 
that goes to Paulfield Cottage, which is next the one right at the very top, just going off underneath the word word sprinkle itself. And that date stone is 1641, and that date stone is felt to be genuine uh, and to be original. So it's not the oldest house in the area, but it is the largest, and it was the one that was the most prominent in the community and whose owners and uh, residents played very prominent roles within the community. Now, there's various approaches that can be taken to investigating a house, and this one is Anthony Adolph's which is uh, come from his Collins Guide on House History, <coughs> suggesting that you get started somewhere and suggesting some resources to do that. <coughs> Pardon me. Having got started to then go back in time with older maps, specialist maps and more, speci maps and more specialist records, then dig a bit deeper with some of the more peripheral documents and then get an architectural, a historical, a geological context and the geological context is quite important in Spring Hill and then he goes on to things like ghosts I've gone to natural history rather than ghosts but never mind so Spring Hill Bear House we think was built in the mid probably the mid to late 1830s possibly slightly earlier and that screen shows some of the records that I've used to come to that conclusion and we'll have a look at them one after the other so starting with the deeds 1834, a gentleman called John Ashworth purchased land in Spring Hill from these people, William Thursby, Eleanor Mary Thursby and Charlotte Ann Hargreaves. Now, Eleanor Mary and Charlotte Ann were sisters and I think they were related to Ashworth's wife, although I haven't uh, demonstrated or refuted that yet. As an aside, uh, Charlotte Ann Hargreaves was married to James York Scarlett of the um, Heavy Brigade and Balaclava fame. So one place studies can stretch quite peripherally and tangentially if you have the mind to. I didn't actually get that from the deeds for Sprinkle House. I got those from the deeds from Paulfield Cottage, which is the next door but one, um, the one with the early date stone. And the point to draw from that is don't just look at the property in which you're interested, the house or the streets that are of particular interest or concern, but look widely. And I've put there, be politely shameless. And I've now known within the community for somebody saying they live in such and such houses. Oh, have you got your deeds? Can I borrow them? <coughs> so what are deeds? They're documents that prove that the patient who claims to own the land and the property actually really does so. They are less important now because land is registered at the land registry, and we'll come on to that later too. And unfortunately, because the, of the land registry and the registration of land that way, they've not often not survived. But they can give an abstract of title, which is a summary of the transfers relating to that property, going back over many years. And these go back... What, nearly 200 now, but some of the older properties, they can go back much earlier. And so they often give the details for many years and they can allow the reconstruction of a list of the owners, not usually the residents necessarily, but the owners. <coughs> and they often include plans, it, plans that are there to illustrate rights of way, to illustrate, in our case, maps with the water supply, um, showing which particular parcels of land are included or are excluded from the settlements. And included with the deeds are often settlements in anticipation of marriage. Now this was a convenience for married women who allowed them to maintain the interest in and benefit of their property after their marriage and it wouldn't automatically pass to the ownership of their husbands. And these were often entered into as legal agreements in which the properties would be put in trust, usually two or three days before the marriage, um, in anticipation that the marriage would take place. If for any reason the marriage wouldn't take place, the settlement would be avoided. And they, because a lot of the owners of Spring Hill House had daughters, um, they are quite important in the um, allowing me to reconstruct the history of the house. Uh, and uh, list in some detail 
which properties are included and which properties are excluded um, with details of um, their, their owners at the time. And they've been quite useful in being able to reconstruct the community at different stages uh, in its history. <coughs> Janet, the day, hello. Can I just pause you a moment and tell everybody? Yeah. I think I found the problem. Excellent. Uh, I think it was probably me. I won't explain it now, but or you can all try unmuting, muting, muting yourselves if you want. That would be excellent because it'd be good to have some more conversation yeah. later, and you don't have to listen to me for an hour. Sorry about that. So, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> the other thing that um, are quite often contained, within, certainly within our days, quite a lot, are um, descriptions of various restrictive covenants. It stipulates how wide the path should be. It stipulates that a certain arch cannot be completely built over. It stipulates that certain land cannot be used for the drying of washing. The other land cannot be built upon but has always to be used as a pleasure garden. Uh, strictly speaking, it gives the owners of about five different properties the use of number one, Springhill Cottage's front garden, but I don't think many people would insist on that uh, these days. But it is a pleasure garden for the entire community and not just for their, uh, for their house. So if you can get hold of them, there can be a fantastic bundle of um, material that you can unpack, analyse, use to synthesise a fair idea of what actually happened to your property over time. <clears throat> and I find them invaluable, not just the ones of Sprinkle House, but of the neighbouring um, properties as well. And even a relatively new house built in the 1980s, approximately two, four hundred years ago, that was actually owned by my father and found in, in his deeds, there was details of the transfer of land that had been owned by the owners of Sprinkle House in the uh, 1920s. So the, the uh, useful information crops up in uh, a wide range of, uh, of deeds, not just the ones for the house in question. As I mentioned earlier, they've been replaced more recently with land registry documents. They have only been compulsory since about 1990. And so land registration at the land registry is incomplete, but the gaps are getting smaller as more properties change hands. And they will summarise the details of every property that is registered. So not just the house in which you're interested, but uh, ones of adjacent properties as well. And that's a screenshot from the land registry for some of the properties in the Sprinkle area as of some day last week. And you'll notice one, two, three, four down from the top is Springle House itself. But then immediately below that, you've got land adjoining. So it's not just the house, but random pieces of land that were originally part of the estate and have become separate, have been sold separately. Somebody wants to extend a garden, somebody wants to buy a lane to protect a right of way. And various parcels of land become disconnected. So that gives an idea of both the ownership of the various parcels of land in the vicinity, but also when, you know, when the land was registered and the details that are contained within the land registry documents gives you an idea of when these were separated off. Unfortunately, they're not free, but I think they're about three pound each and the plans for another three quid and they're well worth getting hold of for not only for the properties in which you're interested, but also the ones that are in the uh, in the location, in the vicinity. Sorry, Janet, where did you get those? Where do you get those from? They're from the land registry. If you put land registry into Google, oh, it, will, right, yeah. it will come up. Before the land registry, in this area, you're looking at manorial records. And when I started transcribing deeds, I had not much experience in, in the kind of legal language that goes with these records. And the phrase would come up repeatedly that such and such did appear before the court and by the rod surrendered. And I was reading this thinking, what on earth is that all about? But locally, our land was what's known as copyhold land. You have freehold you, where you own the land, and the land on the building, you have leasehold where you rent the land and pay the ground rent. And we had a system known as copyhold, 
which the land and the building notionally belong to the lord of the manor, but could be bought and sold. But the transfer involved a surrender of the land back to the lord for a fee and the admittance of the purchaser to the land which was granted to him by the lord, which occasioned another fee. And since the fees were usually about a year's rent, this was a nice little earner for the Lord every time the, the land was bought and sold and also transferred through an inheritance. Um, and these occurred at the court baron, the manorial, well, the manorial courts, and it did once literally involve the handing over of a rod. I think in some places it was a, um, a sod of earth, but certainly locally it was a rod. And this stick would be passed from the person surrendering to the Lord, who would then pass it over to the uh, the new owner and the money would change hands. What's good from our point of view is the details of all this are recorded in the court rolls in, in quite good detail. Um, and they're therefore available to be, <laughs> to be looked at, to be transcribed. And this system existed locally up until the abolishment of the manorial system in 1922. The property rights were reserved to the Lord after the, uh, not the property rights, I apologise, the mineral rights. So although the, the properties are now freehold, any coal or other minerals underneath still technically belong to the Lord of the Manor, and we'll come back to him in a minute. So if you're going to use those, and they are extremely useful if you can get hold of them, you need to know what the manor is. Now, that might not be obvious. We in Spring Hill is part of what's called the Borough of Rossendale in the Rossendale Valley. That's only been a borough since about 17, 1974. Um, the, the town, the borough from which that was formed was only constituted in the 1870s. The manor is the manor of Accrington, Accrington New Hold. But there's no local government, legal, or even particularly geographical connection between Spring Hill, Rosendale and Accrington. And it may, it's not entirely obvious that that's where it is if you don't uh, know the history. And that itself was part of the honour of Clitheroe, but um, the records are actually in the County Record Office, which is in Lancashire County Record Office in, in Preston. Most manorial records these days probably are in the county record office, but many still may be private. And if so, the notional lord is often a solicitor lurking somewhere. And if he still owns the mineral rights, then it may be possible to find out who he is and therefore be able to approach them and ask where the um, older manorial records are and whether you can have access to them. That may well involve a fee if they're still in private hands, but... Uh, they, they may be traceable because the mineral rights are retained to the Lord when the property rights were surrendered. And that might be a way of being able to find out uh, who has the records. So that's deeds, land registry, manorial records. Third one is maps. And they are a good way of charting changes over time. The first map is said to have been surveyed. It's the one on the left-hand side, uh, underneath where it says Cloughfold. Said to have been surveyed in 1831. And Sprinkle House is the one underneath the G, not the, not the first one that's horizontal, the one such two, three underneath that, um, just where the road begins to turn round. The second map is from the first Ordnance Survey, which was 1840s. And the third map at the bottom, the one with Sunday School as opposed to Baptist Chapel, is around 1880. And one of the things that I have literally, I've looked at these maps hundreds of times and literally just noticed preparing for this evening, is that one of the roads has actually moved northwards between the second and the third maps. And I'm going to have to go and do a bit of exploring as to why that might have, might have occurred as well. But they are good ways of charting um, changes in your, both in your house and in your location, wider location over time. There's relatively little building up between those three. 
more recent maps will show that the, the area being uh, becoming more infilled. So the gap, the land between where it says on the on the uh, top right hand map, meadow at one stage and Baptist church, that land is gradually becoming infilled, but was originally farmland belonging to the owner of Spring Hill House. <coughs> fourth reason why I think it was built in the 1830s were the census records. It was existing in 1841 where it was owned by John Ashworth coal merchant and that's another reason why what is under the ground might be as relevant as what is on it in helping understand the history of your house and its inhabitants. That's where he made his money. Um, where he was he was living with his wife and a daughter and a servant. By 1901, it had been divided, and one half was all, was inhabited by John Albert Lord, a flower seller, and the second half was inhabited by E. A. Turner. Now, if you notice on the 1901 census report, the bottom one, the name Robert Charles Turner has been crossed out, and E. A. Turner written underneath it. E. A. Turner was the actual owner to whom the uh, the property had been left in one of these settlements in anticipation of marriage we referred to earlier. Uh, it looks like she was there but her husband wasn't. Now I'm no architect <coughs> but architectural features can be of importance in helping to date the, uh, uh, the building of the property and also date changes over time. Springle House is actually the one in the middle distance behind the, be, behind the man with the horse. Um, and you'll notice numerous chimneys. And that picture was taken round about 1900. And there's a wealth of resources that are available to help in dating your house with architectural features. Uh, top left is a couple of books that I found quite helpful in... Um, explaining what the various features are and how they change over time. And with this being a Victorian house, the Victorian house explained has been quite useful there. The websites with house data is from a website known as Bricks and Brass. And that has a dating tool where you can answer questions like what are the frontage made of? Are there uh, any stringings, which are the sort of pretty coloured bits of brick between the windows, um, what kind of roof they've got, whether there's a porch, whether the porch is original or not, what shape the windows are and so on and so forth. And you can answer questions in there and that will give you an approximate dating time. Doing that for Spring Hill House gives the date later than the other evidence suggests that the house was actually built. That may reflect uh, alterations over time. It may reflect the fact that I'm no architect and I've answered the questions wrong. So it's a tool like some of the others. Use it, but treat it um, in the context of the rest of your evidence and not go off any one particular source. And you may have to look up a few architectural terms. And the other thing that can be useful is uh, details for model estate agents. And the bottom right is the estate agent's leaflet from when the house was put on the market about eight years ago. And they will quite often give a description of the house. They will quite often give floor plans of the house. They will quite often give interesting, albeit somewhat imaginative histories as to why the house was built where it was and what it was originally used for. And in that sense, they're secondary documents. They may or may not be accurate. But I find them interesting as primary documents in their own right, as what the people who are trying to sell the property want you to think about it and the message that they are trying to give about the house that you're interested in. So that's a, a range of resources that can help with assessing some of the architectural features and whether um, the timing, the dating that comes from that is in contact with the rest of your data. And the other good question is, why did he build it here? He wanted to build a house somewhere. Why did he build it there? Well, one reason is it has its own water supply. It's called Spring Hill for a reason. And if you look at the Ordnance Survey map of Spring Hill, you will notice the sign for a well or spring occurs um, all over the place. 
that water has been harnessed and it's been piped down the hill and led to supply the properties of Spring Hill so that when the house was put on the market in about 1896 one of the advertising features was it had good water and it still does have its own water supply independent of the um, the water grid the United Utilities grid second is it's on the turnpike road so it's easy to get to it was turnpiked in the late uh, 1780s um, and the old roads <laughs> It's a bit of a diversion. Local residents were immersed quite frequently in the 17th century for failing to maintain the highway. And if you look at what was then the highway, you can see why it was impassable. That it's no better these days. So having a turnpiked road, a good quality road, immediately accessible makes it a more attractive place to live. And certainly some of the olders, um, so some of the owners use horse and carriage quite frequently. Um, and we'll there be able to get in and out. It was close to the parish church and it was within half a mile of an expanding town as well. And the area in general was developing quite rapidly with um, industrialization with the textile trade. And although most of them were steam powered mills, they needed to get their coal from somewhere. The coal scenes in themselves were not particularly well developed or but were suitable enough to work to earn the money to drive the mills and the fact that the mills needed driving made them worth working later on as the railways came in um, <coughs> they became less viable and the mills moved over to uh, other forms of power they became less viable and many of the mines closed and ashworth who built spring hill house got his money from mining the coal to supply the, the growing industrialized mills so I think that's some of the reasons why it's built where it is. But it was extended in 1855. And if you look at the map at the top corner, sorry, the plan at the top corner again, you can see the number seven, the original house, has these two little ones sticking off towards the bottom left-hand corner of that picture. And those two houses, as they are now, were the extension in 1855. So in the main picture, Springle House is on the right, the one that's been sandblasted. And the one that's straight facing, the, the dark one, is half of the extension, the other half is behind it. And then on the far left hand side, the whitewash building was actually the billiard hall that has now been turned into um, a bungalow. And people who are knowledgeable about these things tell me that the extension is actually better constructed and of better stone than the original property. So why do I think it was extended in 1855? And again, there's some sources that can be useful in, in pinning that down. So the obituary of one of the residents states that it was extended at the time of marriage. RFP stands for Rosendale Free Press, the local paper. And the marriage certificate <coughs> confirms that this gentleman married indeed in 1855 to the, to the woman who was the then owner and resident and who was the daughter on the 1841 census we showed you earlier. And if you look in between the 1851 and the 1861 censuses, in 1851 there was a middle-aged lady and a housekeeper. And in 1860, oh sorry, in 1861 there was the middle-aged lady, her new husband, her housekeeper, a crook, a groom, a gardener, a carriage man. Uh, so he'd obviously brought in a fair number of staff and they had to live somewhere. And it's thought that in part the extension was uh, part of the servants quarters. So why do things change in properties? What are the triggers for a property actually changing? And a major one here has been the deaths of the owners. <coughs> I said at the beginning that it was built by John Ashworth. His daughter was Mary Ann Patrick, the one who married the guy who built the extension. And she died in 1883 and the house passed in trust to E.A. Turner, the one who's been scribbled in at the bottom of the census. But her widower had the reservation to live there and he died in 1895. And at the bottom, there are some of the documents that I've used to put that little narrative together. 
the wills of both Mary Ann Patrick and her husband, Mr. and Mrs. Patrick's death certificates, the settlement documents for Elizabeth Ann Turner in anticipation of her marriage in the abstract of title. But Mary Ann Patrick's will was vague. She died in 1883 and it was still being con contested in 1898 and actually led to a chancery case between Law and Royds, who were two of the nieces of Mrs. Patrick to whom the property was left. And they were essentially arguing amongst themselves as to who got which, who got which bits. And that was eventually settled between them with solicitors, uh, letters and involvements and taken to the chancery as a case, but a case to basically to rubber stamp the agreement that they had reached. And that beautifully has a map of the entire area with a list of all the contested properties to whom they were going to be allocated and who was living with them at the time. But that confirms that the house was still unoccupied and undivided in 1898 when this chancery case was passed. But the new owner didn't live there. And by the time of the 1901 census, as I showed you earlier, it had been subdivided. And the Lord George land valuation in 1910 confirms that the house has been was subdivided at that point. That was the um, valuation of virtually every property in uh, England that was undertaken under Lloyd George. And it's meant ideally to document the owners, the residents, the number of rooms, the size of the garden. Um, fantastic um, resource for your property in 1910, if they bothered to fill in the forms correctly, but they didn't in our place and they probably didn't in many other places as well. And I was also given a description of the layout of it at the time it was subdivided and some old photographs of how it looked at that time. I looked out of the bedroom window one morning and saw an elderly lady and two middle-aged gentlemen staring up at the windows and obviously pointing things out. Now, knowing the house was untidy, I took a deep breath and said, are you all right? And they said, oh, yes, I used to live here. So I thought, right, the house was a tip, but I don't pass up an opportunity like that very often. So I took a deep breath and invited her in and showed her how it had been subdivided further since her time. And she rewarded me with uh, sending me a whole pile of photographs of how it was before the subdivision. So again, chatting to people um, and local knowledge is extremely useful if you have that opportunity. So the new owner didn't live there and it was let to this gentleman who was a felt manufacturer. And I, was one, I knew when he came in, I didn't know when he left. And I actually found that in an entry in the Great Western Railway Shareholders Register. He was left shares in that company from a friend and those that bequest was registered in the GWI registration of probates and that includes his address at the time and the address to which he moved and the date of him going. So, I thought, oh, that's helpful. Thank you very much. So again, think widely and search everywhere. But that just popped up by putting his name into, um, I think it was Ancestry, certainly one of the databases, and following what turned up, even if it wasn't immediately um, relevant, or the relevance wasn't immediately apparent. We mentioned earlier about deaths of owners being important triggers for change. And after the death of... Um, Mrs. Turner, to whom it was left, it was sold to this gentleman, Mr. E. L. Constant, or rather Dr. E. L. Constant, because he was um, a GP, a physician. And that is actually the receipt for one of the houses, and we'll come back to that. But if you notice on there, he has given the receipt for the sale of a house on a bill that he would normally use to charge for his medical services which indicates that he actually practiced out of the property. I found no other evidence of that, but I think it was used um, as a GP's and that he practiced from the property as well at some stage. Another useful source of information has been the um, 
minutes of the various council meetings and although it says Rosendale Borough Council there I apologise that should be Rottenstall it's Rosendale no it was Rottenstall thing and new houses need new sewers so the Highway and Sewering Committee April 1934 resolved <coughs> the plan should be approved and that is to alter these houses and the associated plumbing requirements for doing so and that was when what was the original one Springle house was divided further from two into three and what was the 1855 extension uh, was split in half and that was passed by the committee that uh, Dr Constance should be allowed to do this and also in the same minutes is there that a lamp was granted <coughs> to light the back, pay the back um, lane in Spring Hill and that came up extremely useful about 70 years later when the local council tried to make the residents pay for the electricity and I was able to fish up this document and show that no the council had agreed to pay it and so they could carry on doing so thank you <laughs> so <laughs> back to that bill <coughs> pardon me the house was um the house was then subdivided between two to three and the receipt as I mentioned earlier was written on uh, an old invoice for medical services. What is of interest is that the receipt is actually for the purchase of Vaughan House, but Mr. Harry Taylor actually purchased Sunset View. So Comston has given him a receipt for the sale of the purchase of the wrong house. And because the buildings were altered, that leaves marks within the structure of the property itself. We know from other documentary evidence that Springle House was extended in 1855 as I mentioned earlier. We also get an idea that that happened because if you look in Springle House's airing cupboard there's the remains of a blocked up window that would look straight into Sunset View's landing. And these are further evidence of the alterations that were made when the house was subdivided in 1934 and that's obviously a blocked up door on the left hand side between Lawn House and Sunset View. And the right hand side shows the top end of Sunset View's balcony with the remnants of a staircase going diagonally from top left towards bottom mid. Um, that just appears to be a staircase that goes from nowhere and went to nowhere. And I've not yet been able to work out how that actually would have been in the times before subdivision. But alterations do make their mark. We mentioned earlier that it was used as a GP's. And between the 1960s and 1990s, it was used for as a nursing home. And rather ambitiously, it was registered for private nursing, maternity, educate and train medical students, nurses and attendants, carry on the business of private hotels, ambulance proprietors, dealers in stretchers, organisers of garden parties, to purchase buildings, offices, factories, mills, works, wharves, wharves, eight miles from the canal, but okay, if you want to buy a wharf, Roads, railways, tramways, etc., etc., etc. They really went to town on these association, um, these articles of association. But actually, all they ever did was use it as a nursing home. And after it stopped being a nursing home and reverted to private dwelling in 1991, with the increased regulatory requirements on nursing homes at the time, it became non viable to run it. It returned to being a private dwelling. But Google Maps seems to think it's used for a private detective agency, to the great amusement of the, um, the current owner, who knows nothing about it. It's worth exploring some of the more civic aspects as well. It's in a conservation area. It is uh, underneath, pretty much underneath the word, the, the vation bit of conservation. Um, and there's documents pertaining to that, it's incorporation in the conservation area. And they again describe some of the architectural features as to why people think it should or shouldn't be conserved. If you are really lucky and your property um, is listed, then uh, the Historic England website has some excellent descriptions. And if you, um, if your property is uh, managed to get in Pesno or something like that, the uh, general books of um, architecturally worthy buildings then that gives useful descriptions as well although they may not be accurate and you mentioned uh, underground and that that is of uh, been of importance in this property 
this is reassuring that there are going to be no um, the, the possibility of future mining underneath the house is unlikely that, that's that's good to know that really mm -hmm. but uh, it is interesting to know what is there um, and the nature of the soil and uh, mineral rights and things like that so there's the mining report again from Fullfield Cottage rather than Spring Hill House but it's next door but one and we mentioned that there was water Oops. we mentioned that there was water and that is the source of the spring that supplies the water that uh, gives Spring Hill House its private water supply on a rather grey November day so these are some of the sources that I've used the deeds, the censuses, BMD data, newspapers. The return of the owners of the land actually added nothing new, but in uh, 1873, the owners of the land were asked to declare it, um, and that can confirm who was in your property at that time. The land valuation, maps, photos, land registration, and so on and so forth. And some of you will have found some of these useful for your own work and some of them will have a different uh, sources that you've used. We don't think the tithe map survived, to my great frustration. Every other one has but mine by the looks of things. Um, the enclosure maps haven't survived if they were ever made. It was enclosed quite early, so they were probably never made. The absent voters list appears not to have survived. And there's 30 years worth of electoral road for the mid 20th century that's missing, although the rate books have survived, so they fill in the gap to some extent. So my top tips will be to think widely, both on the sources and the wider area, because sources I hadn't expected to throw a light on the history of the house and its residents have done so. And sources pertaining to the wider area have answered questions about the property. Just ask people politely, but be completely shameless. Make the local studies librarian your best friend and enjoy it. And some questions to discuss. What approaches have other people found useful in exploring their house histories? What other sources have um, people found useful that I've not looked at? What do people think about the relative roles of the personal sources who lived here, the births, the marriages? the deaths, the, um, the movings in, the movings out, the building sources, so the maps, the um, architectural evidence, the council plans, and the contextual sources, so things like um, the coal mining and the growth of the turnpikes and coming of the utilities and things like that. And how wide to cast the net? Where do you actually stop in doing this? Because uh, there's more, always more somewhere new to explore and uh, always new resources to uh, to consider and to look at. So I'll shut up now because that's been long enough. And um, yes, any answers or comments on those discussions would be very welcome. I think we are all blown away, <laughs> Janet. By the... I'm sorry, I've written on for the past hour nearly. <laughs> <laughs> well done to anybody who's still with me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh that, was, that was brilliant. Brilliant, Janet. Oh, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> You've really set the bar high for the <laughs> kinds of things that we can be finding. And it was a useful illustration of how when you have a one-place study, you tend to accumulate lots of little snippets of information oh, and you never know what those snippets are going to be useful for. And because there were some things in there I would never have thought to go looking for, but I possibly do have. And there might be mentions of particular houses that I'm looking at. So I have the massive advantage of, of living here. And therefore, being able to wander around and cross-check the maps, the deeds, yeah. what's on the ground, talk to the neighbours. Um, I, I think you've done a fantastic job from New Zealand, Alex. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen me do anything in particular. <laughs> no, but I've seen your website. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so I will say that doing it from New Zealand is a bit of a disadvantage when we're looking at the built heritage because I cannot obviously pop over and admire the buildings in my place in England um, and check out those architectural features. I'm reliant on the few photos and things I do happen to have or other people's observations. Um, some of the buildings I'm looking at are listed buildings, so at least I do mm. have those descriptions as well, but yeah. Yeah, there's, there's only so far I could take it from here for that that side of things. You have to find a buddy locally. 
I, I think I might have to, yeah, put the word out to my few um, local history friends that are living in Wing <laughs> and see, see if I can entice some of them along on this adventure with me. Um, a place that I found quite useful is eBay. Um, right. I, I have a, a standard search that's set up. Um, admittedly, I get a, quite a lot of junk. It was with a name like Debenham, mm. where everybody's frocks come into on, on the shortlist. But if you put in, um, what I've done now is I've put in Debenham Suffolk. And so right. everything that's got those two words in it, eBay sends me a list. So I get every postcard, every map. Well, I'm sure I've got every postcard and every map that relates <laughs> to the area. <laughs> doesn't do anything for your wallet but uh, no no and, and very often idea. with things like postcards and maps you can actually save the image without actually having to buy it yes that's true and a lot of them of course the old ones will be out of copyright yes and if you're lucky the seller has also scanned the message on the postcard and you'll find that it is either from a current resident or to a former resident and it yes. does contain useful information so um, I know one of mine I've been able to identify the exact house the doctor lived in because they'd actually conveniently marked it with an x on the front of the postcard and then mentioned on the back <laughs> of the postcard that they'd done that. So. That's very kind of them isn't it? And I it think, was great, yeah. 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 I think must uh, be Simon, is it Simon? I can't remember his surname has done quite a lot of work in reconstructing his place from the names and address of people on the postcards that he's picked up. Well, Simon Last. That's it, yes. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I've done, um, I'm not just looking at one house, but um, with obviously with maps, because I do a lot with maps, as you realise, mm -hmm. with taking four different years of 25-inch maps and laying them one over the other. Yeah. I've looked at a, a terrace local to us, and you can they, the 25-inch map shows you on that terrace all the different dividing walls between them wow. um, and the garden, you no, know, the garden fences and things. So I can see each, basically every 20 years or something, how the internals of the terrace have changed. Um, you need to align the maps very accurately for that, which I can do, and if anybody else is interested in doing maps, I can help. Um, but that's uh, that's been very helpful in looking at the details. The other thing that helped actually was I've taken people on walks and told groups uh, as we walked around. And when we looked at that terrace, we stood and looked at the terrace for maybe 20 minutes, half an hour. And just standing and looking, you see tiny little things, you know, little alterations of uh, some because they were all built at the same time and all all pretty well identical but obviously by now they've all changed slightly so just standing and watching <laughs> looking has been very helpful mm. Mm. yes it's uh, on my to-do list will be to align up the maps as, as you've described <laughs> i'd love to do that yeah well i can help what you want <laughs> thank you for taking you up on that i like Sorry. your reference to the land registry Janet, I've not tried using that. Right. I found it's contained um, snippets, particularly of covenants and um, restrictions from deeds, and they have then referred to the deeds and the settlements, and it's begun to fill in some of the gaps for some of the properties, because there's only 12 houses, of some of the properties in the area that have not actually been managed to get hold of the the, the proper deeds so yeah i think it's well worth a look because mm. it's not over expensive in the great scheme of things unless your property unless your town's huge you may not get them all of course but yeah. three pounds yeah, a piece isn't too bad compared to the cost of a certificate mm. yes they did sound more interesting than their own new zealand ones <laughs> they got more fun things on <laughs> or it could just be that you struck lucky <laughs> Possibly, yes. <coughs> and you can work out what your neighbour's mortgage is if you really lose the as well. But that's not the idea. What, one of the thing, one of the problems I've got um, is with censuses, of course, there's no details of uh, in the early censuses 
any numbers or any places you know so i've got to work out who which houses were which and there's they're subdivided and people living more than one family and um it's it's quite difficult and i've not managed that the pubs are easier and people yes. who live next to pubs help but um that's a long job that i'm going to have to try and do work out what was there when and of course you can't assume that just because somebody is in the village in two consecutive census entries that they actually lived in the same house oh no no you can't you know? <laughs> oh well, he's there and he's there but he's, he may not have you know, he's not moved but he may well have done more than once fact, one of the things i did was i i drew a diagram of where i thought the people well basically listed people on each side of the road in one census and then listed again in the next census and drew lines between the different families to see who might be still in the same house and who might and it didn't help a lot but uh, it was <laughs> fascinating trying to do it well, what, we're moving away from the house history a bit one of the things i found fascinating with that is the different occupations of the neighbors so even within spring hill the 12 houses you you have the coal merchant you have his servants you have his farm um, but you you have washerwoman and you have um, a flower seller and it, it's a good occupational mix just within the small area but that's moving away from the history of the property and back to the people one of the things again by by doing these walks around the village um, I spoke to a lady in one of those terrace houses and she said oh yes there's a stone up at, right up under the eaves of my house and it's got these initials and I think that's so-and-so who owned the house first. And by doing a little bit of work with deeds and newspaper reports, I realized that was actually the builder's initials and it, everything fell into place with the, the builder and it helped to find out who actually built those. Now I haven't actually done much research on the builder, but he was from Suffolk. So there's a big question. Why did a Suffolk builder come to Huntington Shire to build? Yes. And um, so, there's, it raised things, but it helped to educate the uh, the owner of the house as to uh, what that little stone meant. Oh, I'd love to know who built it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other resources people have found uh, helpful? I haven't hmm. got into the nitty gritty of the detailed research yet, so I don't don't have anything to report on that front although i have hit up the library for an awful lot of books <laughs> <laughs> and i'm just waiting to arrive one thing i have found useful as well when we're talking about the memorial records is um you know the, the i work full time and the county record office is 40 miles away so getting over there isn't particularly easy they will copy um and send particular articles on request that are not actually that unreasonable fee but the catalogue for those areas that it does cover is sufficiently detailed that you can actually work out quite a lot just from the catalogue entries themselves and although obviously you want to get hold of and check the primary sources as soon as you can it does give something to work on to begin to lay a basis on which to build and to prioritise what you're going to spend your money on and what you're going to spend your time researching first. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very, very grateful to whoever's done the catalogue at Lancashire County Record Office for uh, the degree of detail that they've put in. Um, and a lot of that is uh, fed through to Discovery, the National Archives uh, catalogue as well. And um, So you can learn a lot without actually hitting the, the primary sources, although it's obviously good to do so as soon as you can. Another problem we have, though, is that particularly for the old ones, the 16th and 17th century ones, which don't pertain to my house, but to the wider area, um, is that partly they're in Latin and partly the court rolls of that time are so, um, what's the word I'm looking for, in demand by researchers that they're very particular about who they will allow to access the originals. So you are then reliant on the transcript to some extent um, with all the errors that go with transcriptions. It's, it's selective and there's obviously errors involved with it. 
and it's the old dilemma between allowing access to primary sources so you can check your facts with preserving the primary sources so that other people can use them in the future. Digitise as soon as possible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, Janet, do you want to use oh. a, a few minutes, maybe you and Alex, talking about the shared endeavour? Do you want to um, say what's what, what you're expecting to do on that? Yeah, can do. Um, so the shared endeavour for the next 12 months is the built environment and uh, the house is the... The houses in the first quarter of that and there's a list of both resources and inspiration triggers on the website they're on the website am i right yes yes that's right uh yes thank you alex for um, to give ideas both of questions that you might like to ask about the houses in your place but also some of the resources that you may like to consult in doing so because this is focused very much on one or two houses you may want to take a broader view you know, why is that street the way it is? Why are the street numbers the way they are? In about a mile from my place, um, there's a gap of about 200 in street numbering because when the numbers were originally done, there was a gap in the road that was not built upon and the numbers were allocated on the basis that they'd be filled in with Victorian terraces. And then when they weren't, they were filled in with 1930s semis and there's, there's fewer houses than there are numbers in the gap. So number 200 and something goes to number 390 something. Okay, why? Um, why did they build a particular estate where they did? What was the, uh, how do the types of architecture compare? Whatever you like, but the first quarter is going to concentrate on housing. Second quarter, we'll be looking at um, workplace related buildings, sorry. Uh, workplace related buildings so in my place that means factories um, other places it might be corn mills it might be engine sheds it might be banks farm yeah fine no farms <laughs> all those agricultural labourers and farmers you know I'd love a nice to change from cotton weavers <laughs> yeah oh. cotton weavers everywhere but hey yeah um so depending on your place and what are the, the buildings that are associated with employment in your place and resources and uh, trigger questions for that will be up shortly in the um, beginning of april yeah third one yeah, i can't so remember the, offhand the plan is, yeah our members will be working through the year working on the broad theme of the built heritage of their place so the main trigger are the buildings in those places, but also any other built things in your place and if you're a member just log into the member section of our website and you'll be able to access those resources and if you're not a member please join us we're a friendly bunch yeah we'd love to have you along <laughs> we'd love to have you. <laughs> but seriously i've learned so much from the other members and uh, you know sharing and bouncing the ideas off in like groups like this it's been great um, the third quarter escapes me at the moment alex helps it's, it's community janet yeah community so all those um community centers sports and leisure that's sort, that's sort of that's thing. it yeah yeah pubs sports hall working men's clubs mechanics institutes um that kind of thing and then the fourth quarter is a lucky dip so it's anything that's you right. want to do that hasn't been covered by uh, follies and bridges or um, milestones yeah yes yeah. that's a good one yeah, oh, you're expecting to a really Sorry. good fun range of things because everyone's place will be different when it comes to yeah. other physical built things that tell part of the history of their place so we're mm -hmm. looking forward to seeing what everyone has in their place that meets the lucky dip category well yeah. i guess that would include my my railway that didn't come there was meant to be a railway spur coming to debenham yep and i found loads of references to it and loads of um adverts in the local paper for buying shares in said company but it never actually existed <laughs> it never actually and there's even a bridge where it was meant to go over the road but it didn't wow and it's it's a really it's called the we know locally as the midi the mid suffolk light railway and uh so there's all these documents for something that never actually existed uh, sounds like a perfect case study for the fourth quarter there. <laughs> yes. I was going to say, can we book you now? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> why, why were they going to build it there and then why did they not? Uh, well, I think they ran out of money or they never got enough well, money okay. to pay for it. Um, and it was only meant to be a spur. It was actually going from somewhere to somewhere else and somebody who I believe lived in Debenham, one of the lords of the manor, um, thought it would be nice to have a railway coming through Debenham mm -hmm. or to Debenham as a little spur, but it couldn't raise enough money. So what I've got you... plans. And in fact, there is still a little where it was going to come from was a place called um, uh, Brockford, Brockford come weathering set. But they couldn't afford the number of letters to spell <laughs> Brockford come weathering set. It's actually in weathering set. They couldn't afford to, the number of letters because you had to pay for the sign according to how many letters you had. So it was just known as Brockford. <laughs> That sort of thing's fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> yes. The coal merchant that we referred to earlier also had shares in the turnpike and one of his mines was on the hill above the turnpike road, just above the toll. And he had two roads built going up to the, um, the mine so that his customers could get down on either side of the toll and not have to pay the, the fare. <laughs> Which to say he owned the turnpike company as well, or at least had shares in it. But he must have made the right call because there's no evidence that the turnpike ever paid a dividend. Oh, uh, oh I do love this hobby. It's great. <laughs> it is great. It's great. Right. I think, I think our time has come. Our time is. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank for you listening. For Thank you for contributing in the discussion. That's been good. Thank you, Peter, for the tech. Really yes, appreciate after it. After the first well, five minutes. You, <laughs> You're very welcome. Enjoy putting it together. And uh, yeah, any feedback, comments, suggestions for future work, welcome. I'll let you know. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Pop them on YouTube or through the Google or wherever. Okay. Thank okay. you all for joining. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Good night. Okay, bye. Bye. Have you stopped recording now then? <laughs> <laughs>